Well, then now the, the fears of many were manifest when King James began to appoint Catholics to high office. So this was, this was panic time in Parliament. James was obviously reconverting England to Rome because many churches now were dumping out their Anglican ministers and putting in Catholic priests. And then in 1688, his second wife, Mary of Modena, gave birth to their first and only child, a son whom they named James Edward Stewart and baptized him a Catholic. That broke the terrible building effort to do something about it and the opposition movement burst into the open. Across over the channel into the Netherlands was William Prince of Orange, ruler of the Dutch states, and he saw this as an opportunity. He wanted England to come in and help him stop Louis XIV. If he would go over, he thought, and put an end to James II, who was his father-in-law because he'd married James's daughter Mary, are you keeping track? <laughs> if he put an end to James II, Parliament would make him king. So he led an army across the channel. He was encouraged to do this by the magnates in London who wanted to get rid of James. James formed an army and went out to meet him. James' army went over to William. Well, now William was in charge of the country uh, with the English parliament uh, behind him. Well, now the, the odd part about it is, is William of Orange wanted to be king, but the parliament didn't really want him as king. But he had this wife, Mary, very popular princess. She was Mary Stuart, James's daughter, and a Protestant. William and, and Mary both were Protestants. So they decided, all right, we will make you joint rulers for life. William III and Mary II. And that's the way it worked out. This was called the Glorious Revolution. No blood was spilt. Well, I think there was some blood spilt, but not enough to warrant it to be a bloody revolution. William wanted the English army to go help him with the French. Louis XIV realized this, of course. He, he was watching what was going on. He was waging his wars in Europe. And he thought, well, we will have to divert these imbecilic English away from my efforts in the Netherlands. So I will take my cousin James, who is now here living with me, and put him at the head of French troops, send him over to Ireland, and attack England from Ireland. And this will keep William occupied. And that's what they did. And in 1690, war broke out in Ireland when William, not waiting for much, managed to develop a quick army from England because the English were worried about this. They didn't want this to happen. And over across the Irish Sea he went and uh, made war on the French-Irish for some months. But it culminated on the River Boyne when William and James and their armies met and it was a catastrophe for the Irish. The Franco-Irish efforts were overwhelmed completely. James fled back to France, and that was the end of him, and the Irish were decimated. Now, the interesting aspect of that is that every year today, the members of the Orange Party march in the Catholic districts. The Orange Party represent William of Orange, Protestant, and they march in the Catholic districts, especially in Northern Ireland, that's the only place they're doing it, and rioting breaks out every year. And while he was riding his horse in the country, his horse stepped in a molehill, stumbled through the king. William broke his collarbone. The collarbone wound became septic and in a week, William was dead. He was only 52. He was the hardest working, most able of the whole crew of Stuarts. And he wasn't even a Stuart. <laughs> but he was a man of principle, and that of course set him aside from most Stuarts. And he was determined, but he was dead. His enemies went on for years drinking a toast to the little man in the black velvet suit. They were referring to the mole. 